In today's video, I'm gonna go over the math and no calculator section from SAT practice test seven. I've scored perfectly on back-to-back -back SAT math sections, and as I go through this practice test, I will give you the most efficient way to answer each and every question. So be sure to pay close attention to the process that I take as I answer these questions. And with all that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's go ahead and get started. So the equation above relates to the number of minutes X Maria spends running each day and the number of minutes Y she spends biking each day. In the equation, what does the number 75 represent? Well, since it's X plus Y, we know that 75 will represent the total number of minutes that she spends running and biking each day. So that's going to be answer choice C, not A, not B, and not D. Moving on to number two, which of the following is equivalent to three times the quantity X plus five minus six? In this case, we can go ahead and distribute that three to the X as well as to the five. That's going to end up giving us three X plus 15 minus six, which will give us three X plus nine. So our answer for this question will be answer choice C. All right, moving on to number three. It looks like we got some ordered pairs. So we're asked which ordered pair x, y satisfies the system of equations above. In this case, we're told x is equal to y minus 3. So we're going to want to go ahead and plug that in. So we're going to have y minus 3 over 2 plus 2y is equal to 6. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and multiply each side by 2 just so that I can get rid of that 2 in my denominator. When I do that, I'll have 6 times 2, which is 12, is equal to 2 times y minus 3 over 2, which will just cancel those 2's out. So that'll just leave us with y minus 3. And then we also have to take this 2 and multiply it by that 2y, which will give us plus 4y. Next, we can go ahead and combine our y's. So we have y and plus 4y. That'll give us 5y. Next thing that we're going to do is add 3 to each side so we can start isolating our y. When we do that, we're going to get 5y is equal to 15. At that point, we'll divide each side by 5 to isolate y. 15 over 5 we know is equal to 3. Therefore, y has to equal 3, and our answer has to be answer choice B, since answer choice B is the only answer choice where y is equal to 3. All right, moving on to number 4. Which of the following complex numbers is equal to the quantity 5 plus 12i minus the quantity 9i squared minus 6i for i is equal to the square root of negative 1? Now, in this case, what we can do is since we have i squared, we know i squared is always going to equal negative 1. So we can go ahead and substitute in negative 1 next to that 9. So let's go ahead and do that. Let me erase this. We're going to have i squared put in negative 1. Negative 1 times 9 is going to give us that negative 9. So let's go ahead and rewrite this problem out now that we've done that. Now we're going to have 5 plus 12i minus negative 9 minus 6i. From here, we can just go ahead and combine our like terms. So we're going to have that 5 minus negative 9, which will become 5 plus 9, which will give us 14. Next, we're going to have 12i minus negative 6i. So we got to keep in mind this minus sign gets moved over to where that negative 6i is, which will give us 12i plus 6i, which will ultimately give us 18i. So we're going to have 14 plus 18i as our answer, which will be answer choice D. All right, moving on to number 5 now. Let's go ahead and take a look at 5. So we've got if f of x is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 3, all divided by the quantity x minus 1, what is f of negative 1? f of negative 1 just means we're plugging in negative 1 for x. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to have negative 1 squared. We know that negative 1 squared is going to give us 1. Then we'll have that 1 minus 6 times negative 1, which 6 times negative 1 will give us a negative 6. We'll have 1 minus negative 6. Then we'll have plus 3 all over x minus 1, which x is negative 1 in this case, so negative 1 minus 1. We can go ahead and fill out what the rest of this is going to be. It's going to be 1 plus 6 plus 3, which will give us 10 over negative 2, which will give us negative 5 as our answer. So our answer for number 5 will be A. All right, moving on to number 6. A company that makes wildlife videos purchases camera equipment for $32,400. The equipment depreciates in value at a constant rate for 12 years, after which it has no monetary value. How much is the camera equipment worth four years after it's purchased? Well, four years after it's purchased, out of the 12 years of which it retains any sort of value, means that it's going to lose one-third of its value. Okay, and keep in mind it's losing this value. It's going to lose one-third of its value then. So if we're going to lose one-third of 32400 that's going to put us right around that $21,000 mark. And we don't have to do the actual math because we see by estimating that the only number close to losing one-third of the value is C. All right, moving on to number seven now. Which of the following is equivalent to the expression above? So we have x squared plus 6x plus 4. One thing I'm looking at immediately is the 6x right here. I see I'm going to end up getting x squared with all of these answer choices, but in order to get to that positive 6x, I have to have plus 3. I can't have minus 3. Having a minus 3 right here would end up giving me minus 6x. So I can get rid of C and I can get rid of D. From there, I see I'll have x squared plus 6, but this 3 squared, right, this 3 getting multiplied by another 3 is going to get me a plus 9. So in order to make that plus 9 a plus 4, 
in order to get that to a 4, I have to go ahead and subtract 5. So I need to do minus 5. So my answer there is going to be answer choice B. All right, moving on to number 8. Ken is working this summer as part of a crew on a farm. He earns $8 per hour for the first 10 hours he worked this week. Because of his performance, his crew leader raised his salary to $10 per hour for the rest of the week. Ken saves 90% of his earnings from each week. What is the least number of hours he must work the rest of the week to save at least $270 for the week? So he wants to save at least $270. All right, in order to do that, we know that he's saving 90% of his earnings. We're going to put up a 0 0.9 in front of his earnings. We know that he made $80 already because he made $88 per hour for 10 hours. So eight bucks per hour times 10 hours gives us $80. And then in addition to that, we know that he's earning $10 per hour the rest of the week. So we're gonna mark that and represent it as 10H for $10 per hour times the number of hours H he works. From here, we can go ahead and divide each side by 0 0.9. So let's go ahead and do that. Dividing each side by 0 0.9. 270 divided by 0 0.9 is going to give us 300. So now we have 300 has to be less than or equal to 80 plus 10H, 80 plus 10H. From there, we can go ahead and subtract 80 from each side. Subtracting 80 from each side gives us 220 is equal to 10H, right? 220 is equal to 10H. Divide each side by 10 then to solve for our number of hours. And we see that our number of hours must be at least 22. So our answer there is going to be answer choice C. So C is the correct answer for number eight. All right, from here, let's go ahead and move on to number nine. All right, so this is going to be an inequalities problem. We've got Marissa needs to hire at least 10 staff members for an upcoming project. The staff members will be made up of junior directors who will be paid $640 per week and senior directors who will be paid $880 per week. Her budget for the staffing is no more than $9,700 per week. She must hire at least three junior directors and at least one senior director. Which of the following systems of inequalities represents the conditions described if X is the number of junior directors and Y is the number of senior directors? Now, being completely honest, if I was taking the SAT on my own and I saw this question, I would have probably stopped after I read that she has to hire at least 10 staff members and then that her budget's no more than $9,700 per week because I can solve it with just those two facts. So me reading the rest of this, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and cross it out because in reality, honestly, I wouldn't read it um, except for this last part that tells me what I wanna solve for. Okay, so I'd probably still read this part, but even that's a little bit questionable um, because I know I can go ahead and solve this with really these two facts right here, which I'll mark in orange as well so you know exactly what I'm referring to. The fact that we have to have at least two staff members and that the budget's no more than 9,700. Since the budget's no more than 9,700, I have to have the less than sign right here. So I have to have this inequality here. Okay, her total budget has to be less than or equal to 9,700. Because of that, I know that I can go ahead and get rid of answer choice A. I can also then go ahead and get rid of answer choice C. So now I'm between B and D. From there, I can just take a look at which one shows that she's gonna hire at least 10 staff members. Well, that's gonna be where X plus Y is greater than or equal to 10 as it is in B. So B would be my correct answer. If I look at D, that would be her hiring um, less than or equal to 10 staff members, which is the opposite of what we want. So our answer there is gonna be B. All right, moving on to number 10. So we've got an equation above with A, B, C, and D. If the equation has roots negative one, negative three, and five, which of the following is a factor of that equation? Well, the factors then could be X plus one, they could also be X plus three, and they could be X minus five. So if we go ahead and take a look at our options, the only options that correspond with potential factors are answer choice B. So B will be our correct answer for 10. All right, moving on to number 11. So we've got an expression. Um, where, y, where x has to be greater than 1, y has to be greater than 1. What is it equivalent to? All right, in this case, since we're dividing, we have the same base, so we're just going to subtract our exponents. So we're going to have x to the negative 2 minus 1 third, which we know is going to give us x then to the power of negative 7 thirds, right? Or x to the power, if you want to write it this way, x to the power of negative 2 and 1 third. And then for our y's, we're going to have y to the 1 half, y to the power of 1 half minus negative one, which is the same as plus one. So we can write that as y to the one half plus one, which is equal to y to the power of three over two. Now, in this case, we know that y to the power of three over two has to be in the numerator because there's no negative sign in front of it. So to represent that, we could write that as y times the square root of y. So answers b and c both have that, and d all have that correct numerator. Answer choice A we can get rid of because it has the wrong numerator. Next thing we can look at is our denominator. Our denominator should show that we have an x squared along with the cubed root of x, right? We see that in answer choice D. Answer choice C would be x to the, and I'll just go ahead and write this out so you can see it. Answer choice C would be x to the power of um, 
x to the power of 3 halves is what answer choice C would be, so that's incorrect, or negative 3 halves. Um, and then answer choice B, once again, that's not even close uh, to what we'd have as our correct answer. So correct answer there is going to be D, as you can see in number 11. Keep in mind that the negative sign with the exponent just means that it's going in the denominator. All right, number 12. The function f is defined by f of x is equal to x plus 3 times the quantity x plus 1. The graph of f in the xy plane is a parabola, which of the following intervals contains the x-coordinate of the vertex of the graph f. Here's what you need to know for this one. The x-coordinate of the vertex is going to be the midpoint between our zeros. In this case, we see that since we have x plus 3 as a factor, one of our zeros will be x equals negative 3. Since we have x plus 1 as our other factor, our other zero will be x equals negative 1. So therefore, our vertex has to be at the midpoint between the two. So our x-coordinate for our vertex would have to be at negative 2. We just find which, um, which interval has negative 2. We see that that's going to be interval b. No other interval has that point. So our answer there is b for number 12. All right, number 13. Number 13, we're going to use the remainder theorem. I'm going to show you what this is. It's going to save you a ton of time, so pay close attention. If you have a polynomial up top in your division problem, like we do here with x squared minus 2x minus 5, and then you have uh, x minus 3 or some uh, binomial in the bottom in your denominator, if you have a binomial in your, de binomial in your denominator, you can go ahead and take this 3, and since all my answer choices here have different remainders, I can just solve for what the remainder is and solve for this problem really quick. I can just take the 3, plug it into the polynomial up top. So I'll have 3 squared minus 2 times 3 minus 5. I see 3 squared is going to be 9. 2 times 3 will give me 6. So I'll have 9 minus 6 minus 5. It'll give me negative 2. answer is going to have to be D. Okay. The reason that we can do this is because of the remainder theorem. Keep in mind that if it was in the denominator x plus 3, then we would have to flip the sign and we'd have to plug in at negative 3. Okay. So understand that as well. All right, with that being said, we've answered 13. Let's move on to number 14. A shipping service restricts the dimensions of the boxes it will ship for a certain type of service. The restriction states that for boxes shaped like rectangular prisms, the sum of the perimeter of the base of the box, keep in mind that the perimeter is just at the base of the box, and the height of the box cannot exceed 130 inches. So we can go ahead and write that out. It has to be less than or equal to 130 inches. We'll represent H with height, and then we're also going to have the base of the box's perimeter, which will be 2 times its width plus 2 times its length. All right, the perimeter of the base is determined using the width and length of the box. If the box has a height of 60 inches, so we'll go ahead and substitute in 60 for our height, and its so length is 2.5 times its width, which inequality shows the allowable width? All right, all we got to do here is plug in the fact that its length, so L, is equal to 2.5 W. So we'll have 2W plus 2 times 2.5 W, okay, because we're plugging in for the length. And then that is going to have to be added to 60, and it must be less than or equal to 130. We can go ahead and subtract 60 from each side. Subtracting 60 from each side will give us 70 has to be greater than or equal to 2w. And then we have plus this 2 times 2 and a half w, which will give us 5w. So 2w plus 5w will give us 7w. Then at that point, we can go ahead and divide each side by 7 to solve for our allowable width. When we do that, we end up getting that our allowable width, which is represented by x in this situation, must be less than or equal to 10, but since you can't have a negative width, it also has to be greater than 0. So our answer is going to be answer choice A. All right, moving on to number 15. This is the last multiple choice question. We've got the expression 1 3rd x squared minus 2 can be rewritten as 1 3rd times the quantity x minus k times the quantity x plus k, where k is a positive constant. What is the value of k? In this case, what I want to do is pay attention to this negative 2. I can take that negative 2, and I can set it equal to this minus k times k, and then also applying that one-third to that as well. So we're going to have one-third times negative k squared. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move that negative sign in front of the one-third. So I'll go ahead and do that, move that negative sign in front. From here, what I want to do is I want to get rid of my negative one-third. So I'm going to multiply each side by uh, positive, or I'm sorry, negative three. We're going to multiply each side by negative three. That way we can isolate k squared. When we do that, we'll go ahead and cancel all of this right here. So we're left with k squared. And then on our right side, negative 2 times negative 3 will give us positive 6. Now we have 6 equals k squared. We're going to take the square root of each side to solve for k. When we do that, we get that k is equal to the square root of 6. So our answer for 15 will be answer choice D. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the free response now. So free response, we're going to be starting with question number 16. We have if 2x plus 8 is equal to 16, what is the value of x plus 4? Well, immediately I recognize that half of 2x plus 18 is going to be x plus 4. Therefore, half of 16 has to be what x plus 4 equals. Half of 16 will be 8. So my answer there is going to be 8. Moving on to number 17. 17 gives me a figure. I'm told that m 
uh, to Q and NR intersect at the point P, NP is equal to QP. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that down, that NP is equal to QP, and then I also have MP is equal to PR. So I'll mark that on my diagram as well. What is the measure in degrees of angle QMR? So QMR is going to be this angle here, which I'm going to mark with Y. So I'm going to mark that angle as Y. We want to solve for angle Y now. So to do this, immediately what I'm looking to do is I see it's an isosceles triangle, which means that angle I marked as Y has to be the same as this angle PRM here, right? This angle right here, PRM. All right, so since it's isosceles, all I got to do is solve for what the angle that I'm going to put in orange right here, okay? So this one with 60. Since it's along that line from M to Q, then I know that that angle's got to be 120 right here. Now that I've solved for that angle being 120, all I got to do is do 180 because that's the total number of degrees in a circle. Subtract that 120, it's going to leave me with 60. Then I got to divide that by 2 since it's the isosceles triangle. So 60 over 2 we know will equal 30. So my answer is going to be 30. So 30 is the angle QMR. All right, from here we can go ahead and move on to question 18. So we have the number of radians in a 720 degree angle can be written as A times pi, where A is a constant. What's the value of A? Well, we know that in a 360 degree circle, or just 30, 360 degrees, is equal to 2 times pi. Therefore, if we're doubling that to get to 720 degrees, we would have to have 4 times pi. In this case, we don't need to, to write pi since we're, we're told that it's written as a pi. Therefore, a must equal 4. So our answer here will be 4. All right, moving on to number 19 now. If we go down to 19, we have the graph of a line in the xy plane passes through the point 1, 4 and crosses the x-axis at the point 2, 0. The line crosses the y-axis at point 0, b. What is the value of b? So we need to solve for the y-intercept here. We see that our slope as we go over 1 to the right, so as we go over 1 to the right, which is a positive 1 in our denominator for our slope, we see that we go down from 4 to 0. So we go down by 4. So our slope is negative 4. So we're going to put m to represent our slope. We know that that's negative 4. So if we're going down by 4 every time we go 1 to the right, then when we go to the left, we're going to go up 4. So when we go from 1 to 0, we're going to go up 4, which means we're going to go to 8. So our y-intercept will be 8, and our value of b will be 8 as well. All right, moving on to number 20. The expression above can be written in the form a times y squared plus b, where a and b are constants. What is the value of a plus b? All right, well, to do this, we're going to go ahead and distribute our 10 to our 10y squared. That's going to give us 100y squared, so I'll go ahead and solve for a first. Well, in that case, we'll have 100y squared plus 100y squared, which will give us 200y squared. So 200y squared, therefore our a value is going to be 200. So we can go ahead and mark that down. a will equal 200. Now we got to solve for b. Well, b is going to be the 7532, 7532 minus, or I'm sorry, yeah, plus 10 times negative 110, which will be minus 1100. All right, from here, we see that that is going to end up giving us 6,432. We see that we have to add that to this 200, so we know B is 6,432. All we have to do is add those two together. When we do that, we're going to end up with 6,632 as our answer. Hopefully this video was helpful. If it was, make sure to like and subscribe. In addition to that, if you're gaining value from my videos and my channel, please consider donating. The links are in the description. In addition to that, if you're looking for private SAT tutoring, college essay editing, or college admissions consulting, be sure to check out my website,